This micro lecture is about carbon feedstock comparisons. When you have an opportunity, please click on the provided link and visit the Tower Garden website. Vertical gardening completely rewrites the yield per acre per year equations. They are expensive to develop, but then the yields per acre are incredible, much like algae. The Tower Garden designers claim this style of agriculture can produce as much food as a 15-acre farm using only about 2,500 square feet. It also requires only about 5% of the water that typical soil farming requires and can generate around 20 times more yield per acre than traditional farming. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. So here is the agricultural productivity map again. Remember how well it overlapped with the lights at night? That relationship has a lot to do with money. So it's not unrealistic to say that one of the big reasons we are so productive is because of the money we have had to develop the appropriate infrastructure to supply water and fertilizer to the crops, as well as develop the technologies necessary to get high yields per acre. The value of this infrastructure becomes even more apparent when you consider the contrast between where agricultural productivity is highest and where natural biomass grows the most. The most favorable growing conditions on Earth are not where the most agricultural productivity is happening. Like we have previously discussed, biomass is carbon, but also hydrogen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. It is mostly carbon and oxygen, but that 5% hydrogen and 1% phosphorus carries a significant cost. Watering efficiencies for field crops are pretty bad, so it takes a whole lot of water to grow a metric ton of biomass. Likewise, phosphorus utilization efficiencies aren't very high in a field setting, so we see a lot of phosphorus runoff that pollutes our lakes and streams. Biomass must have these things to grow, and to grow fast it requires even more of them than normal. When you consider that the utilization efficiencies for hydrogen and phosphorus are so low, you really have to think carefully about what crops actually make sense, where to grow them, and how much to grow. Maybe someday someone will make me remove this statement, but thus far most of the political pushes for food versus fuel are led by politicians openly supported by livestock lobbies. Like we have previously reviewed, there have always been non-food crops grown, and they have always competed with food crops for resources because both are produced using the same intensive agricultural methods. Energy crops are no different. They too will require the same resources as other intensive agricultural crops, and they will all share North America's resources and work under the same market economics that drive every commodity crop. The food versus fuel argument is heavily distorted and primarily driven by politics, not logic. So how do all the biomass and carbon resources compare? You will hear a wide variety of yield data in today's media because the marketing guys are never really questioned. The data I am presenting here is based on USDA statistics since the 1920s, so it's fairly objective compared to most everything else out there. It is an overall look at the annual dry ton yield per acre for most of the large commodity crops and bioenergy crops in the United States. Please take a moment and familiarize yourself with this graph before we discuss it further. Also, for those that are not familiar with silage, I would like you to Google this term. Silage is when we harvest the entire plant for its biomass, not just the grain portion. We put this biomass in a silo, and then we let it ferment a little, and we feed it to animals in the winter. Silage is pretty close to the types of biomass we consider when we think about cellulosic ethanol. The first comparison I want to draw is between conventional biomass, algae, and fossil fuels. There is no question that if we can make algae work at large scale, it will be the highest yielding biomass per acre on Earth. However, no source of biomass even comes close to the dry carbon available from oil and coal. Fossil fuels are super concentrated sources of carbon, and this has led to businesses, markets, and infrastructure based on a centralized source. 
This is different than the distributed nature of biomass where it is found everywhere but rarely in high concentrations. We are getting very impressive in our biomass yields. Remember that map of where the best natural growing conditions were and how North America was not really included? Well, despite that limitation, our current yields of corn and sorghum biomass are pretty much as high as what the rainforest in Brazil achieves. That is quite a biomass yield and something we should be proud of. However, it does call into question how much higher it can go. If billions of years of evolution have suggested a pseudo-upper limit for land-based biomass productivity in the rainforest, how much higher can we go? Clearly, it is not an actual limit because sugarcane and miscanthus have been grown at a higher yield, but at what cost? And what is a reasonable upper limit? It's safe to say we aren't sure just yet, but we are certainly entering new territory in terms of biomass yields per acre, and good or bad, it's very impressive. As previously mentioned, sugarcane and miscanthus grown in warm climates get exceptional yields. They yield almost twice as much biomass as the nearest competing crops, and three times the biomass a hayfield can yield. In the race for the fastest, largest growing energy crops, giant grasses have set a high bar. That said, it is important to keep in mind that plants capable of this level of growth are often defined as invasive, so we need to measure the risks and rewards responsibly. Biomass yields are fascinating because they are so inflated in the media, and biomass costs are equally fascinating because they are so deflated in the media. Biomass is pretty expensive carbon compared to coal, but not when compared to gas and oil. As a rule, generally grassy biomass and things like silage are cheaper than woody biomass like willows and eucalyptus. There are trade-offs, and both are good depending on the project, but if we are simply talking about costs, grasses are cheaper. Both of these pale in comparison to algae on cost. By this metric, algae could be considered one of the most expensive sources of carbon discussed so far. It probably won't always be, but right now it is. If you recall from the previous fossil fuels lecture, coal is the cheapest fossil fuel, then gas, then oil. While these are fair comparisons based on cost per ton, they do not take into account the complications around using a solid form of carbon. It is no coincidence that the two most expensive forms of carbon are liquids and gases compared to solids. They are easier to concentrate, easier to transport, and easier to use in industrial processes for good thermodynamic reasons. If the best carbon source argument was based on cost alone, we would probably be using more sources of carbon, but it's more complicated than that. Landfill yield is around 500 to 1,000 dry tons per acre per year, depending on facility. Wastewater treatment plant sludge is around 100 to 500 dry tons per acre per year, depending on facility. We shouldn't really compare urban wastes directly to biomass or even fossil fuels because they are such a mixture and so facility dependent. But for the sake of discussion, let's do it anyways. The facts are that these sources of carbon really are quite concentrated. At these levels, and given their close proximity to the places where carbon is needed for fuels and chemicals, they should be some of the most treasured sources of carbon for the bioenergy community. They are extremely challenging to work with, but given all the lessons being learned about the economics of more distributed biomass sources, there needs to be more focus in this area. When you have a chance, I would like you to read the posted link from the cutting-edge news about a pilot gas station occurring in Israel. They are testing methanol and ethanol blends to see what consumers think and how engine performance is, since methanol is much easier to make than ethanol. This is a development worth following to see what happens.